Good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the so far hottest day of the year. Um, I must say I'm really moved that so many of you chose to come, and I regard this as a big recognition of our speaker tonight, and of course also um, for our lecture series, uh, Making Sense of the Digital Society. <laughs> we started this lecture series some 18 months ago because we saw a growing need for a broader perspective on the structural transformations that our societies are experiencing or even actively pursuing. We see a need for broader perspectives that are based on research but also bold enough to sketch out new comprehensive narratives and that reflect, if possible, a genuinely European perspective. We've mentioned this before. Um, the European angle really matters to us because we are convinced that sense-making is a form of shaping our world. And of course, because there is more than one way of making sense of the digital transformation. And that is why we think that a European or several European perspectives will broaden our options that we have in making sense and shaping the digital society. Recently, we observed that the idea of strengthening European perspectives on digitalization is gaining prominence both within and beyond Europe. This concerns the academic field, but also the growing debate on regulation, the digital economy, data protection, and possibly other human rights. For this reason, we are honored and very happy to have Josef van Dijk as our speaker tonight. Her work on the Platform Society has become a major reference point in academic research on digitalization precisely because Jose reflects and advances a specific European perspective. With this, I hand over to our proven moderator, Toby Müller, who will introduce her in more detail. Thank you, Jeanette Hoffmann, for this introduction. Thank you for being here. Uh, as Jeanette already mentioned, this is kind of an um, evening of reversals because, as you know, or some of you who are familiar with this series, it's always the last question of the evening uh, before we have a drink that I'm um, trying to go for the European perspective and ask our speakers, what can we do? What's European agency? Is there room for it? Have we failed already? Uh, it's been kind of a bleak outlook when it comes to the European perspective so far, I think, and uh, I have the feeling that this is going to change tonight um, with our guests. Really shortly uh, about the structure of the evening, there's going to be the short introduction now, then the lecture of our renowned guest for about 45 minutes. We'll have a conversation on stage for, I say, maximum 25 minutes, just the two of us here. Then it's going to be your turn. There's going to be, I think, two microphones here in the venue for your one microphone, all right, um, in the venue for your questions and comments. There's also a Twitter wall. You see the hashtag right um, in front at uh, hashtag digital society and I think we're being filmed again yes we are being filmed again and this is going to be um, streamed on the respective websites of the Federal Agency for Civic Education and the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society okay to our guest she was born in the southern Netherlands uh, and she's now a renowned new media scientist, a professor at Utrecht University since 2017. Before that, she was chair of the Department of Media Studies at University of Amsterdam and the former dean of the Faculty of Humanities. Her studies and her teaching brought her to Philadelphia, to the MIT and the East Coast, to Georgia Tech in Atlanta in the South, among other places. In 2010, she has been elected a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2015, she was the first woman to hold the position of president. <laughs> 
Her subjects vary from the discourse of reproductive technologies and manufacturing babies and public consent, as her book from 2005 had it, to the culture of connectivity, a critical history of social media in 2013. Her newest book, quite close to tonight's lecture, came out last fall and is called, you've heard it already, The Platform Society, Public Values in a Connective World, Oxford University Press, 2018. She co-wrote that with Thomas Pearl and Martijn de Waal. A hugely informative and inspiring read and very clearly written, if I may say so. It's very inspiring because it challenges reflexes when we think about platforms, you know, what's private, what is public. The book also shows that it's not always clear who pays for infrastructure, who can use it, or even the question of what infrastructure is, what a public good is, and how private private benefits actually are in the end. But enough, we have the primary source of all this thinking with us tonight. Please welcome from Amsterdam, Jose van Dijk. Thank you very much, Toby. That's such a wonderful and uh, really too much for the introduction. Thank you for having me on this hottest day of the year. Thank you very much. I always wanted to be here the hottest. I usually was here in, was here in the winter, but for a change, I'm here during the hottest day of the year. So if you see me faint, you know I need some water, right? So I will try to drink lots of water. Well, I'm here indeed not to promote my book, but actually to talk about Europe and responsible platform societies. And uh, thank you, Jeanette, for the invitation. And I'm really proud I can be you know, part of the renowned speakers of this series. Um, it's not going to be an advertisement, but I wanted to show you the book particularly because I didn't write it all by myself. These are my two co-authors. I'm very, very proud of them. And if you can't read the book in English, by the way, we are being simultaneously translated today to German. Uh, and if you can't read the book in English, there's going to be an Italian and a Chinese translation out soon. So, just in case you prefer another language, right? So, um, digital platforms, um, they, of course, we all know that, and that I assume to be some sort of, you know, common phrase, but they have created enormous benefits and very powerful global connections. Let me say that first of all, because I, may, I know is there anyone in this room who has not been using one of the big five platforms over, the, let's say, the past week? You must have been on vacation to some kind of remote area where they don't have, we are not connection, there's no connection to the internet or something. So anyway, we all know how much we have become dependent on these platforms. But since 2016, Problems have been mounting for the tech companies, and we, you probably have heard about the tech lash, which has introduced that sort of you know, mounting problems. We have been talking about disinformation and fake news a lot. Hate speech and trolling was much into the news. Um, we have heard much about the election intervention, particularly the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, it's probably still fresh on your mind, but that, at, as if that wasn't enough, we have had privacy scandals, we've had security leaks, and of course, totally different venue, we've had tax evasion and undermining of labor laws. And that, now I'm just stopping here because you would be totally depressed before I even have to start up the lecture. There's lots about, you know, addiction, et cetera, et cetera. My conclusion so far would be the long-standing values that promote an open society, and by that I mean tolerance, democracy, fairness, I will come back to that, they're compromised in the online world, and that's a world that is dominated by mostly American digital platforms. So my leading question today will be, how can we anchor public values in an open digital society or all the open digital societies in Europe? Pretty much how could we use data for the public good in an online world that is almost entirely dependent on a private American ecosystem of platforms? I will come to that. So over the next 40 minutes or so, I will take you through these four uh, uh, speaking points. This is sort of an outline. I will first explain to you what I mean by platform ecosystems, what I mean by public values. We're all talking about public values. What kind of values are they? 
Who are responsible actors in this digital society? And what particularly are the challenges of Europe? Uh, uh, Toby already pointed to that. Now let me begin by explaining to you what platform ecosystems are. How do they operate and how do we encounter them in the wild? Pretty much in our global online world, you know, that is a world that is driven by platforms and those platforms are fueled by data flows. Now, platforms and data flows can be steered by companies, either companies or states. And the two platform ecosystems that dominate the online world are what I call the American platform ecosystem and the Chinese platform ecosystem. Let me start with the Chinese. Sorry if I drink sips of water because it's so dry here that I need to drink lots of water. China, as you probably know, has its own ecosystem and that's controlled mostly by the state, but it's operated by the big five companies in China. And those you see listed here are Baidu, Alibaba, Alibaba's like the Chinese Amazon, Tencent, Tencent operates WeChat, you've probably heard of that. Jingo Dong Mall is a little less known, but still a very big company. And Didi, Didi is sort of the Chinese Uber. Now, Alibaba and Tencent, they're becoming extremely powerful in this ecosystem and beyond in the online world at large. That's because they're branching out their core businesses into every sector of society. And they're gradually, or actually quite rapidly, becoming gatekeepers to the entire economy. They're wielding uh, power over brick and mortar enterprises through, for instance, the pay systems that they build into that ecosystem, communication channels, but also grocery stores, uh, pharmacies, healthcare platforms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, in China, the state has very strict power over those companies. And in fact, their sheer, sheer size, the fact that they're so big and so few, only a handful of those big ones, actually makes it easier for the authorities to control the data flows that are also in that way accessible to the state. And most of you, I assume, have heard, have picked up in the news, uh, you know, some ideas of how the Sesame Credit system works in China. Any one of you who hasn't heard about the Chinese uh, Sesame Credit system? A few of you haven't. But, well, very basically, this is a very rough sort of explanation, but if you ignore the red light three times, uh, because, you know, and that's being recorded, of course, by facial recognition, that may limit your choice of entering your university of choice. Now, this is a very sort of simple explanation, but the Sesame Credit system is very powerful, is becoming very powerful in China. Now, let me go to the American uh, platform ecosystem, because that has its own big five, and of course, those you all know, you, you know, you've probably been using that for some 15 years now, all of these companies' platforms. Dominated by Alphabet, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft, also known by the acronym of GAFAM. That ecosystem pretty much dominates the rest of the world, which is Europe, Asia, except for China, Africa, and both North and South America. Now, American tech companies have tried to enter the Chinese ecosystem, but in the past they've been oftentimes either banned or censored or forced to align with Chinese uh, companies. Uh, think of Google Search, for instance, which was forced banned, is now trying to get back on that market. Facebook Social Network has tried to enter the Chinese market a couple of times, was actually refused. But on the other hand, think of Apple, which uh, pretty much, I think, 40% of Apple's app store's income is now, the revenue is now generated in the Chinese market. So there's more and less successful attempts of penetrating that Chinese markets by American platforms. However, just recently, over the past few months, we have seen that you know, the, the Americans have, are trying to bar Chinese companies the other way around from entering the American uh, uh, market. Uh, and that's pretty much you know, the current trade war that's going on between these two countries or these two superpowers. However, that will be increasingly hard because those two systems are very hard to actually separate. These two systems, at first sight, appear entirely different. 
Uh, for GAFAM, of course, you know that the data are owned by corporations. There's a huge potential for corporate surveillance of online uh, activities. And of course, that system is underpinned by libertarian capitalism. On the other hand, very differently, almost the opposite, you see that in the BAT system, not the BAT, but the BAT system, data is owned by the state, well, very important to that T instead of a D, the BAT system, data is owned by the state. Civilians uh, are subject to state surveillance, of course, of online activities, but they're actually executed by corporations, and that turns it into a form of state capitalism. Now, although those two systems are entirely ideologically different, they're increasingly intertwined and increasingly hard to separate. That holds for the economic level. Think of partnerships, of shareholder positions, of financial flows. For instance, Uber has a stake in Didi and the other way around. I think they have a 20% stake in each other. And then Didi is, of course, controlled by Tencent. So, you would be surprised once that I I started to look into that only after I'd finished the book and I was totally caught and surprised by the capitalist nature of the Chinese ecosystem. Whereas we hear a lot about, you know, Chinese, uh, the, the American system be, uh, being some sort of, you know, the utmost sort of becoming a surveillance system. Actually, I think it's the other way around. It's the Chinese ecosystem that has become such a, you know, a capitalist, uh, uh, taking over its capitalist nature. We also have you know, it's hard, it becomes harder to distinguish at the technical level. There's the material infrastructure that relies on, uh, for instance, chi the Chinese control the metals, much of the software and the, especially the hardware, the chips that is involved in uh, deploying and operating those platforms. So in fact, the two systems are almost, imp it's almost impossible to disentangle them. So that will be, I think, the most important thing when uh, uh, seeing how the trade war is uh, evolving. I'm not going to talk about China today. That's not my, uh, uh, my issue. We're going to talk about Europe. And of course, squeezed in between the US and China is this continent. And this, our European continent, has pretty much no major platforms. This one is the only major European platform in the global top 50. Anyone guess, can guess who did, which one it is? Spotify. Yeah, Spotify. Actually, on that top 50 of uh, uh, most important platforms, it's number 49, so it's not that big. But more importantly, it's no longer fully European. Tencent and Sp uh, Spotify have now minority shares in each other, and it's, Spotify is actu actually listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So, in short, for online infrastructural services, Europe has become largely dependent on the American platform ecosystem. And here you can read that this was actually, these numbers are from last year, the corporate headquarters of the largest players by market capitalization, they're very unevenly spread geographically. 47% located in Asia, 36% in North America, and 15% in Europe. And the most important thing is that of those 15% plat, uh, platforms in Europe, Europe has very few unicorns. Estonia has Skype, for instance, but that has now become Microsoft. Taxify has become a, quite a big one, has become a, unifor, uh, a unicorn. It's now owned by Volt, it's now called Vo, uh, Volt. And AdGen, which is a Dutch company that is a pay service, which you may probably not know, but those are pretty big platforms. The problem is, there, neither of those platforms have important infrastructural positions, and I will come to that in just a second. When we talk about platform power, it's very important to distinguish the various levels of platform power. It's actually distributed at three levels, and I compare that to a tree, just to stay in kind with the ecosystem metaphor. We have the roots, which is pretty much the internet architecture. It's the digital infrastructure of hardware, of ISPs, internet service providers, but also satellites and data centers, domain names. It's the big infrastructure that the whole tree basically relies on. Now, this part I have not, we have not included in our research. It was just too much, because we have concentrated on the middle and the upper part of the tree, and that's the trunk and the branches. The trunk, by that I mean the, uh, the infrastructural 
intermediary platforms. I will come to that in a second. And secondly, I will concentrate on the branches, which is pretty much the sectoral platforms. I will explain that to you in just a second. Most importantly, most important about this uh, slide is to remember that these, the big five company uh, ownership is now distributed both among its roots, the internet architecture, as well as that intermediary level, as well as the sectoral branches where it's spreading its powers. Okay, so this is just a visual to remind you or to remember when we talk about platform infrastructure. It's a hard thing to imagine, but I try to make it more clear. In the GAFAM, American GAFAM systems, um, American platform company, uh, companies are driven by, you know, not so, well, of course, by market value. In terms of market value, the big, these big five, they form the world's fifth largest economy after the US, China, Germany, Japan. But more important, I think, more important than market value, it's about societal power and influence. These big five increasingly act as gatekeepers to all kinds of social, economic, cultural, and personal online traffic. And that's what you also see in the branches. So our focus has been on the, the trunk and the branches and how, those, uh, in, how these, these two interact, the intermediary and the sectoral platforms. Let's start with those intermediary infrastructural platforms. How do the big five company, uh, uh, companies actually wield those strategic platforms? And by that, I mean we have in, made an inventory of what those infrastructural intermediary platforms are. We have, uh, we have found some 70 that we would call infrastructural, but that's disputable. For instance, social networks like the Facebook Blue app, but also, uh, of course, any other social networks. Uh, web hosting, pay systems, identification services, cloud services, advertising agency, search engines, of course, operating systems, navigation, maps, messenger services, app stores, analytic services, and there's about 70 of those. Now, societies across the globe, and particularly also in Europe, they have come to depend on this infrastructure for organizing all kinds of societal sectors, right? So, and rather than having private infrastructure, public infrastructures, we increasingly see that platformization also means privatization. Now, there's a big debate whether um, we should call these, particularly intermediary services, these infrastructural services, whether we should call them utilities. And because they have been become privatized, that's a huge debate. I'm not going into that because it's pretty much a legal debate, but it's actually very difficult for lawmakers to define which platforms are utilities or infrastructures and which are not. So that's an incredibly refined you know, legal debate. But let me first take you to the next level, which is the level of the branches of the tree. So besides owning and operating those intermediary level platforms, many of the big five companies are now branching out into sectors. And for our research, we have, in the book, we have researched two public sectors, health and education, and two private sectors, news and urban transport. Of course, there's plenty of other sectors that we haven't even touched upon. Let's, you know, for instance, um, finance or, or retail, hospitality, food, you know, Uber Eats. There's so many branches that the big five companies are actually branching out into. And then, of course, that's not only in terms of acquisitions and mergers or partners, but also in the back end of these systems, data flows and infrastructural apps can be tied together. And the sectors, so all the data gathered and, uh, from the various sectors can be combined. To give you an example of how that works, but in the book we have actually gone through each of those sectors, but this is from the educational sector, which you know, I just took as an example. And take, for instance, um, Alphabet Google. Actually, in the slide, you probably can't read the small print from there. I don't blame you, but you can find, you know, I'll be happy to share the slides with you so you can read the fine print, and they're also in the book. Um, take Alphabet Google, for instance. As a company, they control, uh, you know, the intermediary platforms like search, advertising, maps, etc. 
Those are, of course, taken into every sector. But if you, um, I've just uh, put in a few arrow, uh, arrows here, and that is showing you how the data flows between sectors and infrastructures and between sectors actually work. So, for instance, you see that in the transport sector, Alphabet controls 20% of the Uber shares. Google Maps is built into Uber. And Waze, the navigation app, is now acquired by Google. So increasingly, they're dominating you know, the various uh, uh, nodes of that sector. In health, for instance, Google Health is an important app, health app. And 23andMe is partly owned by Google. It's a DNA app. It now controls pretty much, it's pretty much the biggest DNA um, platform in the world. In news, uh, Google has the news aggregator, of course, and in education, and that I would like to focus on just a little bit. Of course, in education, I think the penetration of Google is, you know, almost mind-boggling. Um, Google Apps for Education is now built into Chrome laptops, which are uh, bought by schools, uh, entire school systems. And by that, they bring not only the common apps that you already know from Google, but also ad school administrative systems, tracking systems to track students' performances, to track you know, how they respond to each other, lots of social networking uh, features built into those apps. It's not just ownership and acquisition, but it's the built-in ability to control and connect data flows in the back end, upstream and downstream, the tree, right? As well as sidestream between those branches, between the various sectors. Now, just one more thing about education. In the education branch, in the educational sector, what we're seeing increasingly is that the big five are all, you know, over the past two years have been um, penetrating this important sector for tech investment. For instance, Amazon, it has last year, 2018, has invested 100 million, uh, sorry, I'll start with Amazon, building platforms where the child is the customer's. Uh, is the customer. And that, of course, uh, shows you how much commercial values are built into those systems. Facebook last year invested 100 million in better schools, and those are called summit schools. It's a Facebook project. Um, it's supposed to scale. They are starting in the public sectors, where schools, of course, are way underfunded in the United States, and that's how they take it to other school systems. And I think this has been the underreported story of the year, and that's Google's takeover of the classroom, which was reported last year in the New York Times. It received very little uh, attention. But built into those Chrome laptops, as I just said, are not only a set of apps, uh, Google Apps for Education, and that, of course, goes back to the infrastructural platforms they have, analytics, tracking, and they're combined with you know, uh, platforms that in that sector track every small movement of a child's education. And that, of course, is incredibly important when, when, you, when you take into account how branched out and uh, penetrating these uh, uh, systems have become. Now, each of those platforms, well, the whole platform ecosystem, in fact, is built on commercial values. They're driven by market forces the market forces of efficiency, monetization, and of course, dominance, because it's all about marking market dominance. But what about public values? That's what I stated in my initial questions. What about public values and the common good? Now, Europe, different from America and from uh, China, on the other hand, has substantial public sectors and public space, which pretty much seems to be absent from the American ecosystem. And public values appear to sit in tension, and that's why we've had, I think, those problems over the past few years. They sit in tension with the commercial values that structure GAFAM's arch architecture, the trunk, particularly, of the platforms. Now, first, before we continue talking about public values, what are we, in fact, talking about? What kind of values do I consider to be important uh, public values? First of all, those values are um, very basic values that pertain to our online interaction and online society. Values like security, transparency, accuracy, and privacy. We've heard much about that. You may expand this into values like autonomy, very basic human values. 
And these values, of course, they're not fixed. You're not, you can't go, just go to a store and you know, pick them off the shelf and buy them like they are. Values are often negotiated, and they're negotiated at different levels. For instance, when Google tries to implement its, pla its uh, educational platforms in schools, what, we're s what we see happening is that privacy, the value of privacy of students may sit in tension with transparency. And that transparency may be a very valuable uh, public uh, notion because, for instance, schools could be opening up their data on children's progress to the public or to research. So those values may uh, sit in tension and needs, ne need negotiation. But beyond in, you know, those precise values, beyond internet and consumer values, there are public values that pertain to society as a whole. And those values, they're not exhaustive, but they include fairness, inclusiveness, responsibility, accountability, and of course, democratic control. And these values are negotiated at every single level, starting with the transnational level at Europe, at the state level, at the local levels, but also at the institutional level, you know, all the way down to the professional codes that, for instance, teachers or journalists have anchored somehow in their societal, in, in how they perform their societal roles. Interestingly, or perhaps sadly, connective platforms often bypass or ignore those, you know, sectors, those where those values are negotiated. For instance, institutions or professional codes. They go straight to individual consumers. I was just talking about education. What we're seeing is that individual schools are being offered uh, Google Apps for Education and even uh, Chrome laptops at very, you know, low prices, 150 bucks, which is way underpriced. But that's, of course, because, because Google can earn it back in other sectors or through other uh, 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 services. Facebook, for instance, it bypasses news organizations because it refuses to carry the label media company and hence it ducks regulation. So public values have become increasingly important, I think, not just to our European system, platform ecosystem, but to the entire world. And that brings up the bigger question, who is actually responsible for the platform society? You know, these public values, as I said, they don't just exist, they need to be negotiated at every single level. Um, the very simple answer to this question is, we are all responsible for governing the digital society. But analytically, and this is sort of you know, a lesson I took from um, Political e Economy 101, analytically, there's three types of actors, market, state, and civil society, right? In China, as we just, see, uh, as we just saw, state actors dominate. In the US, <coughs> excuse me, market actors dominate the stage. In Europe, ideally, there's an emphasis on civil society and state actors in balance with market actors. So, in fact, you know, there's a few simple uh, rules in, in Europe. Data are preferably owned by their citizens. That's why we put so much emphasis on privacy. Um, European nations prefer to operate in multi-stakeholder organizations, so, you know, to balance off those three different uh, societal actors. But there's three problems with implementing public values in the European platform society. First, those civil society actors, they're systematically underrepresented in the ecosystem, and particularly in the infrastructural um, part of that ecosystem. Second problem, there's hardly any public space in the American platform ecosystem. Hardly any to come by. And the third problem is that data, um, you know, generated mostly by civilians, by citizens, by uh, users or uh, buyers, those data become mostly proprietary, so they cannot be used for the public good. So those are three major problems we, are, we have to deal with. And that is the kind of challenge that Europe is currently facing. You know, we need to negotiate those public values by you know, the responsible actors at every level, institutional, local, national, and supranational, but we don't own the platforms. So 
that's the major struggle that uh, we as a continent have been in over uh, the past few years. So let me concentrate on that European transnational level. There's much to say about the, the other levels, local, institutional, etc. but I will concentrate on the EU level. So what are the challenges for Europe? which owns hardly any companies with vital infrastructural power, while it wants to project its own ideological values, you know, those values of public space, public sectors, etc. We cannot solve all the problems in Europe, but we can do a few, think, a few things to improve uh, the European condition, I think. And these are a few of the challenges I would like to mention, four challenges that, you know, we could talk about a little later in the discussion. First of all, I think we need to take a comprehensive, integrated approach to data-driven platforms. Um, I was just reading the other day this particular report. It's on artificial intelligence. Of course, data is now the oxygen of, uh, of artificial intelligence. AI, a European perspective. It's uh, just, I think it was published a couple of months, just last year, eight or nine months ago by um, uh, the EU. And it's all, you know, it talks for 150 pages about Europe as a market. And the very last page of that report talks about, pays attention to ethics. It's like, it's almost an afterthought. And that really struck me. There's now, I heard, a high-level group on ethics, which I really applaud. But it should not come as an afterthought, not on the last page. It should be up front. So that is one comment I would like to make on this report. In fact, you know, we're no longer dealing with digital markets. We've heard, you know, we have had many EU reports about markets, but we need to talk about platform societies. That's actually why we uh, preferred this title for the book. We need to look at how markets, governments, and civil society actors can create a balanced, plat balanced and governed, uh, uh, govern this platform society in a balanced manner. A good example, so I want to come to that, you know, it's not all bad that's out there. There's a good example, and this is the British IPPR report, which is called the Digital Commonwealth, from private enclosure to public benefit. I think this one takes a holistic approach to how values need to be negotiated up front, how principles need to be anchored in that digital society, even before you start negotiating the technology itself. So that, I think, you know, you can take a look. It's not much time to, uh, uh, to talk to you about this, but I think that's a very good example of how you could do that differently, particularly at a time when, for instance, now cities like San Francisco are going as far as banning facial recognition technology from their city limits, which is quite you know, quite a thing. Think about it, that you need to pause and think how to put those public values up front. Secondly, I think, I think, <laughs> articulating, we need to articulate value-centric principles at the European level. And now, this could be many different sort of principles, and I totally agree if you say you can't do that just top down at the European level, but that's not what I mean. I buy a few principles, I mean very, you know, simple principles from which nations and local authorities and institutions, uh, where they can actually look up to and say, okay, that's what we stand for. And then they can start negotiating uh, those public values themselves. So what kind of principles would, could those be? For instance, about data ownership. Very simple rule, four words. Data belong to citizens. And that, of course, has everything to do with privacy. But, you know, the, the, uh, on the other hand, open data belong to the public. And by open data, I mean that there is reciprocity between those, you know, who open up those data. And usually, after that, they're becoming privatized, as I just showed in the educational world, by those companies. Re open data reciprocity means there's, it's a two-lane traffic, right? So that could be a very simple rule. Data portability. You can carry data around to different platforms. Very simple rule. We could have that at the European level and then work it into the various other you know, levels of implementation. Data transparency. Data flows could be regulated like money flows. We all, you know, found are perfectly comfortable with the fact that banks are being uh, looked upon as, you know, they are, are in control of data flows and states are actually controlling through accountants, for instance, how those data 
data flows are governed. We could do a similar, implement a similar sort of governance with data flows. Why not? We just have to, you know, be inventive. And finally, software ownership. Open source when open source is possible. Not simply, you know, privatized by default, but if you put up open source as a viable alternative and also support it, I think that would may be, make a major difference. Now, over the past few uh, years, there have been several attempts to do, you know, to sort of propose those simple values for Europe. Tim Berners-Lee, I think, has designed a, a wonderful sort of set of principles. He calls it the Magna Carta for the World Wide Web. And in that, and I think you recognize here, if you can't read it, but you may recognize that he un, uh, distinguishes governments, companies, and citizens. So my three different kind of state uh, state markets and civil society actors. Um, Facebook and Google, ha Google have signed this contract and so have some nations in Europe particularly, but you know it's a bit non-committal. They haven't really committed to implementing these uh, uh, principles or values without, for instance, any obligations or sanctions. Third, I think we need to update and harmonize regulation. That is one thing I think Europe could make a real, real difference. The EU, and I really applaud that, I think the EU has been really taking a big step with the GDPR. It helped set standards on privacy and uh, data protection. And of course, we've had, here's one of my role models, Margrethe Vestager, she has imposed the antitrust fines of, uh, from EU Comp and sent a strong signal to platform companies. This is not, you know, this is our limit. This is where we stop. I think these are wonderful gestures. They're wonderful beginnings, but it's not enough. The current antitrust and competition and private, you know, antitrust legal framework, uh, competition, anti-competition, uh, privacy law, it may not they may all be wonderful and helpful and actually sufficient as, uh, f you know, to be used for that particular part of the legal framework, but they're compartmentalized and they're to some extent outdated. So what we need to do is to update them and harmonize these. They need to collaborate because it's now like you're putting a dent in, you know, a big, big thing. And it's really something that you need to look at as, and I come back to my first point, as a comprehensive approach. And finally, this is my fourth point, um, and last, I believe, um, there, are a few, there are actually too few strong, viable public or civil society platforms in the online world. There's hardly any, and they're not strong enough. They don't have any power. So what we need to do is to stimulate nonprofit and public platforms, for instance, in the public service media in hospital systems where they're badly needed, in education, you know, my example, and for instance, in libraries. One of the problems is that often, you know, as an objection to public or nonprofit platforms, you often hear the objection, well, they do not scale. You know, they work at the local level or at the most at the national level, but not beyond that. And that's what makes them perhaps useful for a small group, but not very particularly useful for a larger uh, global community. Well, actually, I've been thinking about that. We may you know, bring that up in the discussion, but particularly decentralized design, you know, if you, if you design apps, if you design platforms, to do that decentrally, that is actually makes them more manageable. And that may actually be quite a valuable EU principle, even if they do not scale. You can make them interoperable, you can try to think of different ways, but scaling in itself, and that's of course the marketization of the global scale, is not a value in itself, I would say. So I think we should stimulate experiments with that decentralized design and with helping nonprofit actors. So in sum, I need some water before I sum it up. Um, I think many of us, especially you know, people in Europe who have been complaining about American platform companies a lot over the past few years, I was one of them. If we feel squeezed between those two ecosystems, made in China, made in the USA, it's time to rethink our own architecture, our design and the governance of platforms. Indeed, as I said, we're all responsible for creating a fair, open digital society. 
And by all, I mean, I don't know how many there are in this room, but engineers, I mean policymakers, I mean regulators, I also mean academics like myself, but particularly also civilians who care for the society they live in, who want to govern it democratically. I think we all need to collaborate on design and on governance of these platforms. The current tech lash, as I've just been describing or in the beginning of my talk, that tech lash doesn't necessarily lead into a dystopian future. I refuse to believe that there is necessarily, this brings us into some kind of dystopia. And I see very encouraging signs coming from public counterpower. In the online world, we see many local initiatives, for instance, taken by the city. I'm now involved with several of these initiatives in the city of Amsterdam, several cities in the Netherlands, uh, with uh, public broadcast systems and a lot of public uh, organizations who want to collaborate and uh, provide alternatives. We need those initiatives and need to support civil society efforts also raising awareness at both the national level and the uh, supranational level. And I really believe over the past year, um, I think actually after we fit, had already finished the book, so it, I'm so sorry I couldn't put it in anymore, but I really believe there has been more awareness and more consciousness about what non-profit civil sector, uh, uh, civil uh, society actors could do on this level. So. On closing with that hopeful note, uh, there's certainly a lot of hope in that area, and the idea of platform counterpower will hopefully be the topic of my next book. So I will leave you with that thought. Thank you very much, Jose, for that very inspiring talk. I'm trying to do two things now. I mean, I've prepared some questions that only sort of correspond with, uh, with your talk, and I'm trying to react um, in the moment here um, a little bit also. You talked about European values and the lack uh, of them in the architecture of the US platforms. You said there were much more multi-stake holders um, in the European value system, so to speak. Now, my question would be, can you explore a little bit more about what you consider to be European values, actually, and how they could be built in um, in those, you know, GAFAM platforms or disruptive technology, or if that's even um, something to be wanted? Right. Um, first, I didn't say European values. I used the term public values for the kind of values that mm -hmm. I listed. But then, of course, in the European system of European democracies, we have these, the tendency to cooperate much more with state uh, markets and civil society actors. So that is very much a European way of working. So I wouldn't call that a European value, but a European preference for you know, collaborating. Um, yeah, we are, I think we see them on, on different levels, but one example that uh, uh, I want to pull out is the creation of identification systems. We, you know, increasingly we're using Facebook login as a sort of universal identifier to all kinds of platforms in uh, Spotify, for example. Spotify, mm -hmm. you know, all of these companies are trying to become the one and only universal identifier that makes that so they can follow you across the internet, right? Mm -hmm. That's extremely valuable. In my mind, if I regard, you know, from a European perspective, what I would find very valuable is if we would have an identifier that is not provided by the state or, or a, a, a global eye passport, it doesn't have to be global, but it has to be a passport sort of idea, it doesn't have to be provided by the state, nor by the market, which, you know, both of them come with uh, problems, as I just explained, mm -hmm. but they might also be provided by civil society actors. And um, in the Netherlands, we currently have uh, such an identification app that's currently being created by uh, um, a university collaborating with... Um, uh, actually a foundation, it's a non-profit foundation. And having that alternative at least doesn't force you to go either for a, with a market system 
or with a, uh, a state system. And in terms of providing infrastructural services, I would very much applaud the um, emergence of civil society initiatives, non-profit, uh, non-state, non-market initiatives that could provide an alternative to what's already out there, which is trying to, you know, to pull you towards a universal identifier driven by the state, controlled by the state, or controlled by the market. Response to another thing you were saying that data belongs to citizens that this is uh, more or less the European Perspective what does that do that sort of private in um, identifier that basically means that your data belongs to you uh, To the citizens what does that do to the business models? I mean it would do different things to different businesses, right? It, it will be different at Amazon, but let's say for uh, for Google and Facebook because their business model basically relies on uh, um, data harvesting so what would that do to them? Would that be possible? It's doing a lot to, <laughs> to the uh -huh. business model. It basically undermines the business models of uh, the big companies. Now, to some extent, um, you know, the companies have been very protective of the, their business models. But over the past few years, they've all also run into problems because of those business models. And they're seeing that in order to design and to maintain trust in the digital society, they also need to open up to that society and they can no longer rely, we can no longer rely on their systems for a lot of trust issues as we have realized over the past few years. And the companies now begin to understand that in order to, you know, uh, to keep that trust and rely on people for generating their data, they have to come up with solutions to the problem of data ownership. And I don't think, I think most of the companies have now begun to call for regulation in that area, which is interesting. They've only been doing that for the past six months. Now that's becoming clear that it is very expensive to, you know, to come up with models that everyone will trust. And that's why multi-stakeholder organizations would work much better in that respect. So, so that's why they're opening up their, their stakes, literally, to other stakeholders. Those are all, I think, uh, if you understand you correctly, and as I perceive it, pretty recent developments. I think that kind of change that is coming about. We've had times where um, many activists and scientists said, why are we so apathetic to what's happening? I mean, we know what's out there and we know what's being done. I mean, Edward Snowden didn't really change a lot, for example, and uh, he kept asking that question. Um, now it is changing, we can say that maybe, but it's happening at a time where um, Europe, well, the whole concept of Europe is heavily contested. And uh, there's a large, uh, well, say, you know, populist right movement that actually basically wants to attack the very same institutions uh, the GAFAM platforms want to circumvent anyway, in the end, right? I mean, is that um, legitimate to see like that? And what can we do against yeah, that? This is a really, really intriguing question, one that I can't answer in just a few minutes. Um, these developments have been happening after we finished uh, the manuscript for the book, so, mm -hmm. you know, we always finish a manuscript at a very bad moment, but this was when uh, we, of course, saw the populist moving movement uh, being, making big gains also into, in Europe. The interesting thing is that there have been now, in the US, for instance, over the past few months, there have been uh, calls for breaking up big tech companies, not only coming from the Trump administration, but also from uh, the Democrats. So the heat on these companies is now on from very different ideological um, uh, perspectives. And that, I think, makes it interesting because if we look at Europe, if we look at the populist movements here, they have become very dependent on, for instance, Facebook for uh, making their points of view very popular amongst, uh, uh, you know, big populations. In Italy particularly, but also in Hungary. And so the tensions around that, what is it ideologically that we need to invest in, has actually accrued a lot of... Um, um, a lot of power tension, right? So it's the power tension that we, not only between the United States and uh, China on that matter, but also between European states amongst themselves. So it is a very ideological, has become a very ideological debate as to how power is distributed in a system that intrinsically, uh, you know, is not owned by European companies. I think there's a, 
it's again an ideological problem in um, if we sort of juxtapose um, the ideology of the platforms and of the legislators on a European uh, level. Um, the platforms say, you cite that a lot in your book with your colleagues, that they are, you know, um, again, want to circumvent a government, that they do the better job than governments, that they're basically uh, a bottom-up, grassroots type of um, organization that's built in into their architecture that do not even mention um, the role of the state or the nation state or uh, the government or whatever. I mean, what I keep wondering um, how top-down management had become such a bad name uh, in that whole position that you actually cannot mention it anymore. It would be totally impossible for a le legislator to say, yes, what we're trying to implement here is a top-down process. Do we have to look differently at the top-down model, or are there other ways to actually organize it bottom-up, like the platforms say they do? Yeah. Well, that's become the million-dollar question, of course. I don't think top-down uh, uh, governance works any longer. Mm -hmm. Facebook is trying to govern top-down its own uh, blue app, for instance, and, uh, of course, Messenger and WhatsApp and Instagram. Um, that doesn't work. The, you know, the moderation model that uh, Facebook uses, and it is desperately trying to keep it to itself, to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, keep control of its own moderation. It's now hiring 30,000, I think, I believe, moderators to moderate their content, to control their content. And that is more, I've heard, than there are uh, journalists in the United States. So it's becoming crazily, but also incredibly expensive to sort of take over an entire system, implement it into your business model, because it doesn't make any business sense. You know, it, it's simply too, uh, too expensive to do that. And on top of that, you're not going to, be, going to be trusted more because you're now owning all the content moderators you know, are, are actually steered by Facebook. That's not going to work, not in a million years. So I think they have to look uh, you know, to, in a different venue for other solutions. Mm -hmm. It's also not going to work when the state is taking over that, uh, you know, that moderate, moderating function. I don't believe in that either because that, in that respect we will have a, uh, you know, a uh, Chinese system, right? What is the solution? I just pointed it to in, my, in uh, one of the last slides. I think that we've been focusing too much on the global level of, uh, whether it's in content moderation or identification apps or whatever. The global, uh, uh, the global level, you're not going to find any solutions. That's where the problem starts. So I think that the solutions that we need to introduce to counter those problems have to come from the local levels or the national levels. Institutional level is so important. We have, you know, over uh, at the same time when we were seeing that power in these uh, platforms has increased, we have also seen decreased the power of institution. Mm -hmm. And that's something yep. I call institutional collapse, which mm -hmm. I think is a major and underreported problem. Institutions have become pretty much have been pretty much left out of this equation. And that's because they're bypassed by the big platforms, they're undermined by the state. Look at what Trump does to, you know, the EPA, to a lot of institutions in his country, public institutions he doesn't care for, he just doesn't give the money, like the public school systems. And that's where why that institutional level is so incredibly important. That's the level at which we hold the fabric of our society together. And that's what I think we need to invest in at the national level, because most of the institutions, except for a few European institutions, are of course governed at the national or local level. It took, took me a lot of guts to ask that question about the rethinking of the top-down process, but I knew it was going to lead to an interesting answer, so I'm uh, pretty glad about that. You also talked about the platformization as privatization in uh, your talk now. Um, you also do that in your book in a different way, and I um, kept asking myself, is this really a process that has started um, with GAFAM, with all those big uh, platforms, with digitization, or is this, has this not been going on for actually a longer time? If you think about public-private partnerships, which is something that, you know, even leftist cultural politics in Berlin talk about all the time. I mean, this is not just uh, a neoliberal discourse of big, big corporations uh, uh, who want to get into that. It's a very, it's an old concept 
concept and it has done a lot of good things actually too. Yeah. But is it the same or uh, has it led to this or how do you see those in relation, public-private partnerships and platformization, which is actually privatization as you called it? Yeah. Now, of course it didn't start with the first platforms. It didn't start in 2000 or 2001. Google started in 1999. It started in the 1980s, of course, the preference for public-private partnerships, which in practice often meant privatization. Think about Big Pharma, for instance. When we look at Big Pharma, we see the roots in the 1980s, where um, uh, knowledge of pharmaceuticals became opened up, you know, in public-private partnerships. Actually, what it meant is that, you know, 20 years from the 1980s and 2000s, etc., they started to become privatized. You saw exactly the same uh, thing happening in uh, what I now call platformization. That, in fact, started... Think of how the big platforms started out. They were there for the people. They were there for users. They were there as, you know, not as companies, but as uh, facilitators for the public to do their own thing. There was so much promise in that idea of bringing uh, facilities straight to the audience, straight to the users. And of course, nothing has come of that promise, All, almost nothing. And that is, once again, when you bypass institutions, when you bypass people at, or people's organizations at the local level, um, then you, know, you have no choice to, uh, but to, do that pri to become privatized. Does that make it clear? I'm yeah. not sure if I'm explaining that very well. But. No, I think so. <laughs> um, a very interesting point when it comes to agency. I mean, I know your take is not you know, purely normative. It is analytical, but it has some uh, normative aspects even uh, now tonight um, in your talk. And I'm really thankful for that. Um, you write about functional taxonomy of platforms that could sort of, you know, sort out public questions like, you know, antitrust laws, competition laws, but maybe also taxation, uh, which has already happened uh, to some extent. In, in Germany, you talked about Vastager. Um, but again, who would be the agent of that taxonomy? Would it be science, actually, or would it be science in compliance with politics, or how would that process go about? Well, that's why I also talk about who are the responsible actors. And mm. there's no such thing as one single unifying solution to all the problems. It's not that the European Union or the European Commission is going to find one single solution or just one uh, um, uh, committee who's going to solve that. Mm -hmm. That, I think, the need for uh, distributed counterpower, which was basically my last argument, I think that is needed to bring back power to the various levels. I think to your, and you know, that counterpower is different at each level that I mentioned. It's for uh, super, supranational at the EU level. I think we definitely need to look there for anti -competi uh, competition law, antitrust law, uh, privacy law, of, of course. But once, you know, one th for one thing, I showed Margrethe Vestager, who's been terrific in sort of, you know, understanding how the platform system works. And yet, if you look at her verdicts, if you, you look at what the outcome is of her verdicts, you see that she is, you know, only antitrust law cannot solve the problem because they're bound to legally argue within the limits of companies, of consumers, consumer markets, and that's not going to solve a lot of other problems that are not exactly in that type of definition that we make of markets, but it's beyond that in terms of um, not just citizen privacy, but a whole lot of other values that creep into the legal frameworks. And that is why I argue for a comprehensive approach to those laws. I'm not saying that these legal frameworks no longer suffice. I think they need to be updated. But particularly in terms of harmonization, they're not doing, you know, they're not doing the right thing right now. It's too small. It's too little. So we need to think bigger than that. Some legal frameworks are actually there, and I think sometimes they're not being informed, uh, enforced, like in the case of terms of services. You talked about, we've seen that with Spotify, where uh, Spotify has tried to um, 
stop the funding uh, of six Swedish scientists who wrote a book about Spotify, the Spotify Teardown. It's a very interesting experimental uh, scientific book. And Spotify has to try, uh, has asked the Swedish state um, to stop the funding because apparently it, they went against the terms of service. And the Swedish state said, well, no, we're not going to do this because your terms of service have basically been illegal and you have to change those terms of service. And that's something I don't hear a lot about where I kind of wonder is this some sort of quasi-legality that is uh, being enforced or not enforced there? And why does the state not interfere more often with things that you know, clearly do not correspond yeah. with uh, sometimes human rights? Yeah, interesting question. I think states could do a lot more than they're actually doing right now. They look at the European level and you know wait until they come up with uh, like with the GDPR. They wait with a lot of privacy frameworks. Um, I don't think they have to. I think nations should be a lot more creative in finding um, their own legal perspectives and also their own national perspectives. But even more importantly, I think it's at the city level that we're actually right now over the past year are seeing a lot of innovation in finding those principles or rules. Say civil or city, I'm sorry. Cities. Cities, yes. cities. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. municipalities, mm -hmm. cities, yeah. cities like Amsterdam. Sure. Um, Right, in, in, for instance, the city of Amsterdam, I'm currently involved with some of their projects. They're working extremely hard to um, uh, find a set of principles according to which platforms can enter their city governance level. For instance, they've been struggling a lot with Airbnb, not one of the big five, but very important for the city of Amsterdam and probably for Berlin as well, as far as I can tell. Um, they've been they've come up with you know various principles like the 30-day principle. You know, can no longer uh, do more than um, uh, rent out your place for longer than 30 days. They have installed a register. They've come up with all kinds of um, small measures to counter the one platform, Airbnb. Now, over the past year, they've realized that we need an integrative set of principles to act upon. And that is a different perspective. It's no longer going to target one specific platform who is uh, sort of messing up what's happening in the city, you know, the city rules. Uh, but it's looking at it from a very integrative perspective. And that, I think, makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. if our citizens uh, want... Okay, if your platform... Uh, wants to operate within the city limits of Amsterdam, you either you need to allow the city of Amsterdam to open up the data for um, uh, control, right? For instance, how many, uh, how, uh, for instance, one of the problems is that Airbnb has not opened up its own uh, statistics, its own analytics to the city of Amsterdam. So now they can um, pretty much... To do that now? Yeah, no, they have no. still haven't come to that okay. point. But they're thinking of trying integrative strategies who force platforms within their city limits mm -hmm. to act upon those rules. But that, of course, it, it takes a different perspective. You cannot just go one-on-one -on -one with each platform and decide every rule once at a time. You need to have an integrative perspective. And I think they are now, currently, they're working on that. That'd be really interesting to see the day when uh, Spotify's actually have to open up their statistics and their data. Well, it's different for Spotify, of course, but oh. that's that's another point. We always think of, uh, in terms of regulation, as one size fits all. The problem with the platform society is that there is no government governance that one size fits all. And that's why you need to look, I have tried, made one attempt to look at platforms in a differentiated manner, like some of them are more infrastructural than others. Some are, you know, content moderation is a totally different thing in social networks than is, for instance, app stores or identification systems. So you look, you need to look at them in conjunction. You need to see what the differences are, but also how they operate as a whole, as a system. You also talked a little bit tonight about education, not just higher education, but elementary education as well. You also do that in a book, in a, a very interesting chapter. Um, I thought and I wondered if we could, before we open this up to the audience, uh, talk a minute about the idea of the public good, uh, which can mean a lot of things, which is a very contested, uh, I think, term, uh, what it actually entails, who says what's public and what's private. It's a um, relation that is, you know, has been contested for 200 years, I think, more than that. But um, again, 
The problem you outlined there is, of course, one of surveillance also, right? If uh, Google has those cheap laptops for all elementary schools with all the presets and uh, pre-installed apps and so forth, everything can be tracked. So that's the problem of uh, transparency, so to speak. Um, always, you know, entails problems of surveillance. If you see public good as something that is tied to transparency, you still have the surveillance problem sort of built in there. So do you think, uh, could we frame uh, in this context of education, the idea of public good of public good also as one of secrecy, as one of actually something that's hidden even in public schools. Now would you do that technologically? Well, that's precisely what I meant by a trade-off, a negotiation between the values of privacy and surveillance. You know, that's, con that's a constant trade-off. And so within the institutional context of the school, you need to make that trade-off. That doesn't need, that decision and that negotiation should not take place at the company level in Facebook and Silicon Valley. It should take place in the schools. That's where, you know, those data are generated and that's where children have the right to be protected against certain surveillance systems, but also have the right to be protected in terms of privacy. Now, there's another public value that I would like to point out in this respect, and that's autonomy and professional autonomy particularly. Because many of these systems, I heard, well, this is something I read in that New York Times report that I showed, but in the Google, in the, sorry, in the Facebook system, it, that comes with like um, a sort of a centralization of how these apps are made in Silicon Valley, of course, produced there, and then they're sort of exported. But it takes away autonomy and professional agency from teachers and sort of recreates that at the engineering level. So what you also do is you make it less attractive for, an, uh, for, a, for a teacher in a school system to create uh, technology that helps children. And by outsourcing that to a not just a private company, but an engineering company, mm -hmm. you know, you sort of leave that autonomy level to, um, an, uh, to engineers who are basically reinventing education from an engineering level. Now, there are two solutions to that. Either Facebook uh, implements um, non-engineers and educators and pedagogues and whatever uh, didactics into their system or the other way around you you know you try to make teachers become more aware of the engineering systems I don't know which one is hardest to achieve but I think both level at both levels we need to the latter probably collaborate mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's why I you know I also make an argument for um, collaboration and understanding you know te how technology works from a collaborative perspective thank you I think it's time to open up We've been talking for 25 minutes, as and promised. Please feel free to ask your question in German. If I can't understand with my school German what you're saying, I will ask uh, my neighbor to translate it for you. Please feel free to speak your own language, except when it's Chinese, because I don't know that language. I'm trying to keep track. There was a gentleman in the third row who raised his hand first, and it's you, and then it's the woman in the back here. I'm sorry, I hope I'm having it right over you. Please. OK, shall I do it in German, yes? Okay. Ähm, Rudolf Hilscher, ich komme aus der Akademiewelt. Äh, ich habe zwei Themen, die Sie nicht angesprochen haben und wollte Sie bitten, vielleicht da ein bisschen was zu, zu sagen. Das eine, es gibt ja auch noch andere Plattformen, das sind die B2B-Plattformen. Also wir reden von Industrie 4.0. Ich erinnere mich, mein Vater in seinen alten Tagen wollte einen Jaguar kaufen, weil das immer sein Traum war. Und dann hat er sich in einen gesetzt und hat dann gesagt dem Verkäufer, der sieht ja innen aus wie ein Volkswagen. Und das liegt natürlich an diesen B2B-Plattformen, äh, weil sie sozusagen diese Teile überall in allen möglichen Dingen weltweit eingebaut werden. Bitte. Aber selbstverständlich. So, das ist das eine Thema. Also wie betrachten Sie das auch, diese, diese Plattform? How would you translate B2B-Plattforms? A B2B-Plattform is a B2B-Plattform. Oh, oh, okay. Business to business, so to say. Business, business, yes, yeah. so in the Industry 4.0 context. <lacht> I heard we instead of... No, 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 B2B. Thank you. <lacht> yeah. Die andere, die andere Frage, wo Sie auch nicht richtig, wo Sie keinen Fokus hatten, ist die Frage, wo sind eigentlich die Köpfe, die in der Lage sind, solche komplexen Plattformen entstehen zu lassen? Und Sie haben natürlich sehr stark darauf gesetzt, zu sagen, na, da muss von unten auch mehr wachsen. Wenn aber die besten Köpfe für gutes Geld 
aufgekauft werden von den Unternehmen, die das Geld haben, auch das entsprechend zu zahlen, die Gehälter und so weiter, da haben wir natürlich auch nochmal ein anderes Problem. Und ich weiß nicht, ob Sie da auch Zahlen drüber haben, aber das wäre vielleicht auch interessant. Yeah. Oh, the last question, I may have to come back to you. Uh, business to business platforms, very interesting. We haven't focused on that in the book. I know how important they are. I know there, there's a lot of literature out there on business to business platforms. Uh, but it's simply a choice that we made, so I don't know much about it from research. I know they're incredibly important, and I know for one thing that also the... Um, Uh, the big platforms themselves, for them it's an incredibly important angle. But in, unfortunately I haven't done much research, so beyond what you already know, I probably can't add much to that. As for the second questions, I'm not sure if I understood that right, sorry about my basic German, but was that about um, how the local and non-profit uh, apps, for instance, can actually make money because they have to be funded somehow? Ah, okay. Right. Then I just understood the, for, the first part. Very important topic. The brain drain that, um, you know, that's one of the most important issues that is currently being under-examined, I think. The brain drain from, that goes from public institutions and where the public is actually working on uh, non-profit platforms, for instance. Of course, there's much more money to be made in Silicon Valley and with the big companies who, as soon as they spot that talent, they're taking it away. Unfortunately, also from the schools, which I think is a very sad thing that's happening. They're taking away engineering capacity from the schools and uh, uh, also privatize the brains, right? Um, on the other hand, and I want, would like to add this, it may be a side issue, but another thing in terms of counterpower that I see happening in Silicon Valley is Currently, with the big companies' employees, a lot of the engineers this year, over the past year, have been putting their uh, stocks and bonds to use and to raise their voice. You saw the big Google walkout beginning of this year in September or October, um, and that meant that uh, platform employees, uh, company em employees, are beginning to understand that they also have a particular kind of power that they even want to use, even if it's against their own owners, right? And in, in, in fact, you might say, you might argue, it's against their own interest. But they have been the ones who have been arguing for uh, equality in the workforce. They have been the ones who were arguing for, uh, for instance, Facebook uh, content moderation. They've been becoming an increasingly important force, not only because they work there and they are the brains that Facebook and Google make, that makes them valuable as companies, but also because they have been using their stocks To, at the stockholders level, uh, the owners level, um, to become increasingly influential. Thank you. I think there was a second. Hast du es gesehen, Christian? Was war? Und dann kommen Sie drei rein dahinter. Ne? Genau. Uh, thank you very much. Um, on a certain extent, I represent a little the bad guys because I represent the European Commission here. Uh, but not as a bad guy. No, I, not I can as a bad guy. That, I would say. Yeah. That, that I spent 20 years just for the embedding of values into European policy, including with the President of the Commission for more than 10 years. Uh, my question is really related to the notion of values and the values systems into the digital uh, policy frame. Uh, I heard that there are some difficulty to identify values that should be considered as the ones deserving the labeling of Europeans. But on, on that sense, I'm a little perplexed because in the Constitutional Treaty of Europe, in the Lisbon Treaty, we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights where the values are listed, that are integral component of the way how the policy is designed and is on the name of these values when applied to citizens, for uh, example, on the protection of uh, autonomy, that GDPR has been possible because it was based on a value system approach rather than on the market approach on free movements of persons or goods. Then there is a reference that is less publicized that probably that should, but is already there. My perplexity, is, this is the question that I pose to you, is about the need of having a kind of charter of digital values. 
because the basis of uh, human rights is there on the basis of that it was possible to identify fundamental values of citizens, but the basis of citizens' rights and personal liberties into the digital world is something new, and there is a lack of also culture and legal element that could be considered for establishing it. Then would you consider the need to have something as a further step to be needed at the European level for the establishment of a charter of European fundamental values into the digital world? Yeah. For one thing, I just want to uh, address this, what I think is a misunderstanding. Uh, I consider the EU particularly as one of the best forces we've had in terms of setting the standards for uh, these values. I think I cited that at the beginning. I think the EU has done, you know, the best steps that have been taken in this respect have come from the EU. So that, for one thing, I called Margrethe Vestarka one of my biggest role models. So that's for sure. The GDPR, I think, is a amazing piece of legislation. It took six years or longer to, uh, um, to implement that. And I think it's an amazing piece of legislation. My point there was not so much as a critique of the EU. I know how incredibly difficult that it is to uh, uh, reconsider or reassess frameworks. But I think what is needed is also sort of an, a, f a rethinking and harmonization of the various areas in which we're currently very compartmental, have compartmentalized uh, legislative frameworks. So I'm arguing more for collaboration, for collaborative frameworks, for harmonizing those frameworks than I am set against one of these. I think, you know, EU level has been um, uh, admirably on top of that. Um, as for these, the, the second part of your question, um, I'm not sure if I understand it uh, completely well, but um, are, I have not argued for specific European values to put in there. I think they're common uh, public values that you know should also be common public values for that matter in the United States or in China. Uh, I think they have been well, they, they're part of the law. I mean, they're uh, legal frameworks in and of themselves. Um, so I'm not in any sense arguing against that. I think what is needed particularly for the digital, um, uh, for the digital, and that's, I think, what uh, Tim Berners-Lee is also arguing for, he sees that the internet is, some call that colonized, or the infrastructural part is increasingly owned and operated by a few major forces. And in that respect, we could reinforce these public values as the basis of all internet traffic. I think, is that more uh, an answer of what, what you were referring to? I'm not sure if I answered your question correctly. Let's hear it in the back. There's a lady that's been waiting for a while. Hi, hello. So thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, I, I come from the University of Sydney, so I'm pretty far away, and uh, I'm a scholar now at um, visiting VZB. So um, I'm interested because um, in mainstream debates, and it's been obviously popularized in the academy by Zupov's book on surveillance capitalism, um, we always talk about data oil, data economy, and how the data economy has radically transformed capitalism. But sometimes we kind of forget that actually data without the right interpretation, without assembling data, without giving meaning to data, without making sense of them, would be like valueless. We'll have no value, right? And very often when you consider the platform capitalism, we tend to overlook, for example, the immense billion dollars um, economy coming from data brokers, for example. And Europe is already uh, squeezed between China and the US already in the data brokers economy. So my question is, um, I really believe that um, one of the most important battles for Europe would be um, not to lose um, in the space of artificial intelligence. So making meaning, you know, making sense and machine learning, for example. So I wonder um, in this climate, quite worrisome climate of Europe, um, if you think that there is a possibility to um, try to reshape this artificial intelligence strategy, and I know that we have a representative from the European Commission, we know that we are not 
fan of the recent communication by the European Commission because it seems to be too much focused on the market, and you yourself said so um, half an hour ago. So do you think that there is this strength to reestablish this value? I don't want to call them European. I want to call them common values, public service values. We see them in the charter, in the Amsterdam charter, but also in the very famous communication that established public service media in Europe, for example. They were there and they were common. So do you think that Europe has the strength not to lose this battle and trying to shape artificial intelligence in this way? Well, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. <laughs> so thank you for summarizing that quite well. Um, about the report that I just showed, I think um, it's not that it's, this is a bad report. I think it's doing, you know, very good things. It's only that it puts ethics in the last on the last page, and I think it should be up front. But that's, you know, a, you may call that a minor uh, quibble. Um, you rightly point out the. I don't like to talk about data as the oil or the new, you know, the kind of Zuboff um, uh, metaphor that she uses. I think data is though is the oxygen of artificial intelligence. Without data, there is no artificial intelligence. But as you rightly point out, there's something else badly needed in that equation, and that is uh, water, and that is what I think is um, uh, analytics. Algorithms are at least as important as data. You know, without that knowledge to turn data into knowledge, which is algorithmic uh, uh, predictive analytics, for instance, or real-time analytics, without those algorithms, there's never a tree. So we need water and oxygen to grow the tree, but um, both of them are needed to uh, to actually make that tree become blossom, you know, in full bloom. And that analytics may be, you know, we always talk about data as a common good, but the predictive analytics that have been used by companies to turn those data flows into a privatized good are, I think, much more uh, under the radar, and we need to pull them out from there. And by that, you know, let me give you one more example, but the NA NHS um, uh, controversy over the past few years, I think, is a pretty good example, where Google DeepMind came in to provide the analytics. The data were given to them by the 15 or something public hospitals uh, in London, and the analytics, in fact, became privatized. Not even the data, but the analytics that came out of, uh, 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 of those data, proce the data processing. So we need to focus not just on data, but also on the analytics that are used to process these data. And thank you for the summary, which I totally agree with. Two, I don't know who was first. No, I yeah. saw three. Okay. Um, They're already there. Okay. Vielen Dank für den hoch, mich hoch faszinierenden Vortrag. Ähm, ich bin wahrscheinlich eine der wenigen hier, im hier in dieser Runde, die eigentlich gar keine Ahnung von all dem hat. Aber Sie haben das so fantastisch klar erklärt, dass ich mich, äh, dass ich also es wage, äh, eine Frage zu stellen. Vor ein paar Jahrzehnten konnte sich noch niemand vorstellen, dass Russland keine Supermacht mehr ist. Wie sehen Sie in diesem ganzen Zusammenhang äh, zukünftig die Rolle Russlands? Okay, very interesting question. Um, Russia, yeah, Russia was not on my map, <laughs> the map that I showed you. I just uh, concentrated on the two. No, I know. There, Russia is an interesting case. Russia has been presenting itself as an undermining force rather than a uh, you know, superpower in the digital sense. Uh, so rather than positioning itself as another superpower in this global equation, it has been concentrating on undermining the uh, political, ideological and digital forces that, is, that are actually now governing that global ecosystems or system of ecosystems. I think that's an interesting position that Russia is, is, is taking there. And of course, most visibly in the undermining of election, uh, of the recent American election, but also elections in other parts of the world and the European elections, of course. Why is Russia doing this? Mm, you would have to ask a political scientist. I'm not a political scientist. Uh, probably someone who's very, very well versed in geopolitics would probably, you know, explain that to you, but for me it's enough to understand that Russia has taken that position of, of under, being an undermining, underminer rather than a constructive force. 
In that respect, we're not going to get much help from Russia. If anything, it will try to, to play uh, Europe apart, you know, all the European nations, and it will try to undermine uh, China and America at the same time, I believe. Um, on the other hand, it also bespeaks the Russian impotence in coming up with its own system. And that, I think, should make Europe different from Russia, because we, we should really concentrate in Europe on um, principally designing a different architecture. And just undermining, I think, is a very destructive force. And I refuse to believe that there is no, that it's impossible to create a counter uh, force that is also very creative and that can help. Actually, I think it can help generate um, a new business model, for instance, to have business models in that European model that may not scale globally, but that are very productive on a national scale or a local scale or an institutional scale. This is a stray from your question about Russia, but... Bitte, es sind noch ganz viele Leute, die Fragen stellen wollen. Ich muss sie leider unterbrechen. Es sind noch zwei, drei andere Leute und die Zeit rennt ein bisschen. Vielleicht haben Sie nachher noch die Möglichkeit, die Frage weiterzustellen. Go ahead. Thank, uh, thank you very much for your very illuminating uh, talk. Um, I have just one comment about the last uh, topic that you discussed. Um, in one of my capacities, I have three uh, school-aged children. And I'd like to suggest an alternative answer to your question. You asked whether the... the um, Teachers should be, to, should be educated in um, uh, the engineering questions or whether the engineers should be uh, educated in the pedagogical questions. I'd say, uh, uh, and I think I would be in agreement with most um, parents with school-going children, um, that the alternative would be uh, don't let the crap into the schoolroom. Um, you know, when in doubt, switch them off before you come into the room. As an alternative, I would suggest, uh, empowering teachers to find um, creative ways to use them, but that the power should be with the teacher, um, obviously in interaction with their children and what they judge to be good for children. We should be educating teachers to be good pedagogues um, and not letting you know, international companies bring their their machines into, into classrooms. But anyway, um, I do have a question though. Um, my question is, what role do political parties play in your story? Um, you know, I was looking at your wonderful graphic with the you know, civil society, market, and um, government, and you know, even though my eyes aren't as good as they were, but I was squinting hard to see, and I didn't see political parties there anywhere. Um, and the background of my question is that um, I think we're, um, probably most of us will agree that we're experiencing um, a crisis of democracy. And this crisis of democracy has, has a lot to do with the role of um, social media, um, but it's also primarily, it's a crisis of political parties. You know, um, major political parties in, in Germany, like the SPD, are getting washed down the, um, the electoral toilet. Um, the party system in Britain is crumbling in front of our eyes in the most remarkable ways. Um, so what role do you see um, for political parties as you know, mediators or whatever in the story you're telling? Thank you. Very good question. And I'm sorry it wasn't in the graph. You're right. Political parties are not part of that graph. There are many other actors not part of this graph, by the way, because it would be completely filled up with actors. But you're very right. And as a matter of fact, um, we've published a Dutch version of the book in 2016. That book was picked up by Dutch politicians more than any other actor. I was very surprised. I thought I would be invited first by schools and by you know the various institutions, but it was political uh, parties that invited us as authors and come and talk to talk to them about the political implications of what we were arguing. And as a matter of fact, just in recent months, uh, two weeks ago, I was called to the Dutch hearing parliamentary hearing into uh, the digital society and how to govern it, exactly this topic that you mentioned. And this was organized by the Greens and the, S the Dutch SPD uh, equivalent. I think they're picking it up just very recently. They're picking up this theme as an important theme. Um, 
at the various, as I explained, the political level at which it's picked up mostly is the city level. And that I found also very surprising. So the national level, it is political parties that are picking up on the theme, but at the local level, it is municipalities who are trying to implement new systems that are driven by platforms and actually fed by uh, data flows. So at these two levels, um, it was to my uh, certain distress, uh, the, the, like the middle ground political parties, like the German SPD or the Dutch equivalents of that, they didn't pick it up at first, and only very recently they have turned it into a political team. And now I think it's actually the political parties who are calling for um, more awareness, but also for better legislative frameworks. And as I said, this has only been happening since January. So that's the only difference I see with like two years ago where no political parties were actually interested in this topic. We have one more question. Um, and then we have to wrap it up, I think, pretty much. Which, which was first? Christian, do you have an overview? I don't. Huh. Who's the tallest? Yeah, I win. Um, thanks very much. I, um, maybe I'll make it as quick as I can. In work that I do, sometimes we have uh, conversations that come up about, you know, what are we doing this for? What's the internet for? Um, why are we doing this as humans, you know? And so, sure, Silicon Valley will tell you what the tech is for, and we see that actually the tech is for something else. So I kind of I wanted to ask you if you think that there's space in your list of um, things that where we could add something else. It might be off topic, might be a little bit out of, out of scope of the title of the talk. But... The, the item that I would like to see added there is something to do with the non-platform, the non-online, the, the, the right, we have the right to be forgotten, the, et cetera. What about the right to be unconnected or disconnected? I'm a little concerned. You mentioned um, identity provision in the beginning of the talk. You know, sometimes there's suggestions that maybe Facebook might become some kind of a passport provider. Uh, in Mexico, it's not really possible to use blah, blah car without a Facebook account. Um, and in, in, I mean, uh, uh, in Germany, people are still quite into cash, but there are other places in, in uh, Europe where um, participating in the economy is being completely uh, technologi uh, technologized or whatever. Like, you, you know, you can't really buy anything without having, having a phone. And, that's, and people are like, yay, this is great. And so, the, so, the, so the, just to sum up again, sorry, is that this, is, is that, is there scope in talking about responsible platforms to talk about um, the right to no platform? Right. Very interesting question. Uh, the, the right of the disconnect huh, is basically what you're asking. Well, I'm planning, I'm sort of thinking about my next book, which will be, as I just told you, uh, 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 Platform Power and Public Counterpower. And perhaps one of the chapters will be on the disconnected. I think it's a very interesting sort of power where people deliberately uh, choose not to be connected and not to have a mobile phone, not to connect to Facebook. I'm actually a Facebook refusal, uh, refuse nix. Uh, but uh, there's... There's actually people who refuse anything, simply want to disconnect. And I think that's a very interesting power. It's a minority right now. It's becoming an, a, a decreasing number of people. But I think it may be a very important signal to uh, put up. The problem is, though, especially amongst the younger generation, um, you can hardly do anything professionally without being part of that infrastructure without having a, a Facebook ID, without having a login, without having a LinkedIn page. You know, many of your professional environments require that you are part of that digital platform ecosystem. And that makes it so hard to be a deliberate uh, protester, you know, a, a, a disconnect person who wants to make turn that into a, into a signal. Um, Still, I think it's a very interesting movement to have people who are deliberately disconnected. And I'm, I'm going to do more research into that, I promise. I have asked that question um, 
a couple of times, if I remember correctly, at the beginning of the series about disconnecting. And uh, I think the answers I got that um, sounded very reasonable to me usually were, uh, oh, you have to be really privileged to do that. Uh, I mean, most people just do not have that kind or of old. privilege. Uh, old enough to do yeah, that. Or old right. enough to do that. Um, and let me close with a question that maybe is in some sort of relation to that uh, disconnecting, but it's about growth. Because uh, one of the laughs you got tonight, at least for me, was uh, when you quoted Jeff Bezos um, with the consumer in the classroom uh, and so forth. And with Facebook in the classroom, that was, uh, of course, that's funny, but apparently it's pretty normal uh, to some people to view it as that. And I think most of us have, you know, uh, become quite at ease with the notion of being consumers or users, which is something that is not very far away from the idea of being a consumer, not citizen. I kind of perk up citizen, what citizen? Um, you know, it's a totally different concept. And the concept of the consumer, um, of course, is to pay exactly for what he or she has paid for. Uh, or hoped for, usually, or thinks that he or she ordered, right? It's a totally different concept uh, than the citizen, and it's a concept that leads usually to growth. And uh, internet traffic is not called traffic for nothing, right? Because it's traffic, and because it grows and keeps growing. Do you think, um, apart from all those, you know, multi-level, multi-perspective um, kind of legislation and collaborations you talked about, uh, do we have to think about degrowth um, in order to get a grip on these on these things on the internet also? Yeah, absolutely. And you have you didn't even mention one area that I think is most uh, important in that respect, and that is sustainability. Um, data centers. The last time I heard, are going to um, use up 25% of all our. Uh, fossil fuels over the next, and of course they're trying to become more sustainable, but the most remarkable figure I've heard over the last few weeks is that uh, Microsoft is going to build a data center close to uh, Amsterdam, which is going to use up more energy than the entire city of Amsterdam, and that for that they will need an area more larger than the province of North Holland to actually feed their own data center, which is uh, usurpating more than, you know, uh, um, energy than the entire city of Amsterdam. That, I think, is mind-boggling. We're trying to, you know, implement notions like values, like sustainability into our economy. And at the same time, by the same means, these companies are trying to do that by uh, putting up, uh, you know, sustainable uh, sustainable energy solutions, but they take up so much space and so much energy that we're forgetting about precisely this thing. Why do we need all this growth in this area? Why is there no point at which we're satisfied with the kind of data activity that we're doing each day? Do we have to go to the moon to just become aware of the fact that we're eating up our own planet? I don't think we should go that direction. But that's a sad note to end on, don't you think so? Oh, I think we should I, go to the I bar, promised, not I to the moon. I promised to Toby to be <laughs> very sort of utopian, uh, which I can't, but I tr actually I promised to be not dystopian. I said that in the introduction, it's going to be a jolly night, right? Uh, and now so we're we ending on that end note on that again. Sad note. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I am actually an optimist, so I think we can stop that before it happens. Okay, we'll take that. <laughs> Thank you. Jose van Dijk. Thank you for being here. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience.